Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of State of Cybercrime. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by our usual co-host, uh, David Gibson, who's back from vacation. I know many of you uh, missed him in our last episode. Uh, we've also got a special guest today, uh, which is uh, Trevor Bren. If you want to say hello, Trevor. Um, Trevor joins us from Veronis's federal uh, data security engineering team uh, to talk specifically about um, you know, the DOD's response to the data leak. So really excited to, to have you back, David, um, and, and have you here today, Trevor. Yeah, Matt, thanks for hey, having me on. Good to be back. Uh, as usual, we, we always like to get things kicked off in the chat and seeing where everybody is chiming in from. Uh, I'm uh, here today from my, my home in Maryland, and I think, David, you're probably in, in, in Connecticut. Yes, I am. Trevor, where are you joining us from? Another Marylander, just down the street, I think. Yeah, I hope we've got a, a couple more that pop up here in the chat. We, we uh, always look forward to seeing, you know, how much of a, of a global audience that we get on the show. Uh, we are going to gonna crack right into it today. So uh, we, we want to actually start today really by talking about uh, the, the call from DOD to take action in response to the Pentagon Discord leaks. And we'll, we'll remind you guys a little bit about that. Uh, and then we'll go through our usual segments. As always, we, we want to talk about some good news in cyber. Uh, we'll jump on into the danger zone and talk about some of the threat actors uh, that you guys should be worried about. Uh, we'll, we'll round it out with some vulnerable vulnerabilities, uh, including one in a UDP protocol that Mr. Gibson is extremely passionate about. Uh, and we always save time at the end uh, for Q&A. So feel free. We've got ourselves and our moderator team uh, monitoring the chat. Uh, feel free to submit questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll try to cover them as quickly as we can. So, uh, you know, in our in our last episode, we talked a lot about uh, this National Guardsman that appeared to have, you know, leaked some classified intelligence data. Uh, subsequently, he's been arrested for it. Actually, that happened live on the show. Uh, we had our, our viewers chime in and tell us that they, they arrest what occurred. Uh, even even after we had, we had started the show, so that was pretty cool. And, and it really seems to be this this highlighting this this need for you know safeguarding and the handling of classified information. And Trevor, that's why we wanted to bring you on, um, as we know that there's been quite an overwhelming response, both from the community and specifically from the DoD Office of the CIO. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we were talking about this before, as, as a lot's been going back and forth around this. We really don't know what happened here, as um, the government tends to be very hush-hush when these situations happen until they're completely remediated. Um, but what we can use is the actual guidance that they've released for other agencies to kind of figure out or piece together partially what happened just by looking at what they're telling people to fix. And, and what is that, right? Like, I, I think we've seen some things that have come out around, um, you know, that we, we all read this memo from the DOD mm -hmm. CIO. I think there were two deadlines in it. One was around, uh, what was it recertifying access by uh, yesterday? Yeah, and May then, 2nd. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, and I'll have you tell our audience what that means in a second. And then C CIOs have until about the end of the month to do that same thing. So what, what does that mean? Like when, when a DOD CIO says, you know, re certify access by yesterday, like what, for someone that was trying to comply with that, what would that have meant? Yeah. So a lot of times when we see government timelines like this, they're kind of multi-stepped due to just the reality of working at a large agency like that. Um, most of the time we see policy first and then action second. So in this case, it's kind of the get your ducks in a row. We're expecting you to validate that everyone is on need to know right, which is the government term that basically means least privilege. Um, and then over the next month, you're going to be expected to not just enforce it, but make it provable, right? A lot of these come with an audit or they come with a report or they come with some way to actually prove out that you're hitting these requirements. And what these requirements really are, um, are kind of spelled out really straightforward in NIST 800-53, which is the bedrock uh, government cybersecurity compliance document. And it's been around for almost a decade at this point. So really what this is doing is enforcing the the basic stuff that agencies should have been doing and most likely have been missed in this situation. And, and pop quiz for one of our audience members here, what revision of 853 <laughs> are we on? Um, 
and we'll see who who's first to to chime in with that. I, I know that wow. when uh, I first started, I see we got a couple of people who are pretty passionate about that. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with NIST 853, it's all part of uh, what's called the NIST Risk Management Framework, uh, which has to deal with a, a, assessing risk and assigning different security controls to different systems based on that. Uh, we got a lot of people uh, chiming in with Rev5, uh, and one person who thinks we're almost at Rev15,000. Uh, I hope that I get to see the day that we get to Rev15,000, but I predict based on past experience that that might come after me uh, in terms of the release date. Now, the specific controls, Trevor, that, that got outlined, they had a lot to do with lease privilege, with audit logging, and then some things around monitoring. When, when we talk about like, uh, uh, you know, and like AC6, I know you wanted us to talk about today. You felt that was like a really important, it, let, let's kind of think about what might've happened here, right? We've got this, this person who's got some level, maybe too much, maybe just right amount of access to a system. Uh, and they clearly have been able to use that access to leak information. I think these are things that we've all generally accepted at this point. Uh, but why would enforcing need to know or doing an entitlement review help with that? Yeah, so a lot of the data that was leaked was active wartime information, right? When we think about the Department of Defense's mission and what their most critical data is, like active strategy, locations of weapon caches, these are the things that you don't want the adversary to know. So these are the things that we we think that they're going to have under the most lock and key. And if you're not actively involved in that wartime situation, you should be protected from seeing it and that data should be protected from you, regardless of whether there's malicious intention or not, like there was in this situation. So when they talk about need to know and they talk about least privilege, it's should an Army National Guardsman or an Air National Guardsman in the United States have visibility into this type of communication and, and, and weapons and wartime information? And in this case, we've seen no, and we see the reason why, because it only takes one, even though there may have been 10, 15,000 people who have access to this data, which would be too many in that case, the one person who slips up or the one person who has malicious intent ends up causing significant damage to the effort. And, you know, I think another debated thing, I'm actually curious to see, David, both what you think about this and our audience is, you know, uh, we, we figured out the MOS of, of, of Jack Tixera, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, this National Guardsman that got arrested. It seems to be like a cyber transport systems engineer for the Air Force. And it's debated whether or not that meant that this came with privileged access or like administrative rights. Uh, either way, right? Like the the an admin needing to have these rights to carry out tasks and needing to potentially go unmonitored or have unrestricted access. I think that's why we're seeing the controls getting suggested around who's got privileged accounts. Do they have the right level of privilege? And are we actually monitoring when they use that access? This just undermines the importance of trust but verify, which I think is another really common uh, government phrase we all hear. Yeah, I I think uh, you know first of all, least privilege monitoring user access. Who knew, right? Um, you know, kind of a kind of a, a basic thing. I think one of the interesting things here is it sort of shows how an organization uh, can do just about everything right, from like a you know like the, the getting into the building, you know, like a, and uh, blocking at the endpoint, but you know and segmenting networks, um, even having, you know, discontinued or uh, discontinuous or disconnected, you know, islands of information. But if data still gets out, right, then it's kind of catastrophe, right? It's, uh, it's really these, these kinds of attacks, like the insiders, you know, if, if you don't do a good job with walling off what people can access in the first place and monitoring what they're doing these kinds of things are really hard to hard to combat and start and uh, and stop I, I think that's the the, the segment I, I would echo as well like you've got this is supposed to be like the most locked down data short of maybe yeah. like you know let's say like the coca-cola recipe right like maybe there's less people because it's not so many people need to have access to that at one time what i could imagine there are lots of soldiers and leaders on the battlefield that do need access to this intelligence as you talk about trevor maybe more than they need access to the the secret formula or the five or the seven herbs and spices combination but the it, it with the data being so locked down already and this still being at risk of switch, I think this undermines the, the insider risk that we all face, that every organization faces, especially when you think of the motivations behind it. It's unclear that it's clout is the only motivation or internet points is the only motivation for uh, for this particular incident. But I think I think time time will tell on that. Uh, and, and Trevor, you know, um, 
I know you live in this space. You're you're always advising our clients on on what to do here. People that are trying to kind of do the right thing before the end of May. Do you have any tips or recommendations for them on you know how to how to obviously take the the, the DoD's advice and and the, the memos advice, but anything you want to go above and beyond that? Uh, I mean, realistically, one of the biggest problems with breaches like this is the length of staying power, right? So he was gone or compromised or however you want to say it for over a month before anybody realized what was happening. The data that persisted on those discard logs, we don't oh, we only know half of it, right? How many private communications did he have? How many WhatsApp communications did he have? Um, and we can see it called out in, in access investigations, right? After you have a breach or when you catch a breach, you have to have a strong understanding of what happened. You have to have all of your data or all your ducks in a row so you can at least understand what the fallout was, right? We're only seeing the publicly available breach at this point. Who knows if the adversary got access to that information and who knows how much of it we don't even know, how much of it was a breach. So having a strong auditing understanding of who's touching what is going to be really important if this ever happens because knowing what's been breached is sometimes more important than than anything else right knowing the fallout and i just want to echo a sentiment from richard one of our viewers around using some monitoring tools to potentially identify behaviors outside the norm uh would also be helpful here right um now um not, not that we want to put this topic to rest, because we know a lot of you are really passionate about it, uh, but we do have a couple other segments that we want to jump into. So uh, feel free to throw something in the Q&A if you want us to revisit this later. But let's make sure that we talk about good news. You know, uh, every episode, we always want to cover that that the good guys are doing good stuff because there's always a lot of doom and gloom in cybersecurity, yet there's some good stuff happening. Um, and so the, the first thing that we obviously want to talk about here is we've got this uh, crypto bot malware operation, David. So first off, you know, welcome back. Like, so happy to have you here. Rob was a good stand-in, but no substitute for the dad uh, jokes and the puns that you bring to the show. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to be back. Um, yeah, this is good news. Um, I think we'll start out. What what is CryptBot? Um, this is uh, an info stealer. Um, it was uh, first kind of seen or popular in 2019. It was previously distributed by a phishing email uh, in 2022. I came back via this crack software. Um, and I guess the group really uh, that, that Google is now able to disrupt is uh, was tricking users into downloading um, malicious versions of Google Earth Pro and probably more dangerously, Google Chrome. Uh, and so once these were installed, it's malware, steals everybody's inf information. Um, so uh, Google can now disrupt and take down the domains that this group is operating from. Uh, and I guess it's, it's you know, since it's Chrome and it's Google Earth, it's, uh, it's kind of definitely, you know, relevant for Google to, to disrupt that, that, uh, that network as well. One thing that I thought was interesting is this cracked malware was distributed by the site 360 installer. Um, that's kind of the hub. And I think that other malware sites would kind of point people to this. And it was like a pay for install thing. So each of the affiliates or whatever would get paid every time somebody installed this cracked malware. Um, and uh, I just, you know, go back through your history, I guess, your browser history, if you've ever downloaded Chrome or been redirected there. I, I searched through mine just to make sure I hadn't, hadn't you know, I usually am pretty good and about not going anywhere, but. Check this is the first out. time that we've seen Google uh, disrupt a uh, malware ring using it's, it's almost kind of like trademark or copyright as the as the grounds, right? Like these are Google products that are being, you know, uh, rebranded or, or recoded for malicious intent or not even recoded, but just things that appear like Google products. It was something, was it called Glo Glopteba or Glooptiba? I think it was back in 2021. It was like a big botnet that they used yep. kind of similar authority to do. Um, so, you know, shout out if we got any Googlers or Mandiant folks on the line, shout out for, you know, disrupting, uh, you know, being a part of the good news for our show today. Yeah, it's nice to see. Nice to see the good guys get a win. Now, there are a few vulnerable vulnerabilities that we want to talk about as well. Right, David? I, I think, you know, the first one that comes to mind for me is one that we actually authored for the first time in what was it? August of 2021. And it's, it, yeah. go ahead. It's getting the rounds yeah, yeah. again because Krebs released an article uh, just a couple of days ago talking about uh, abusing guest access to Salesforce. Now, 
you're our resident expert on Salesforce permissions. Would you mind giving our audience just like a little bit of background on like how this is possible and then talk about like the impact of taking advantage of, uh, you know, kind of uh, abusing these, these misconfigured communities? Yeah, sure. And this, uh, this blog or this link here goes to our blog and we, we updated it in light of the recent events here. Uh, but we did write about it a couple of years ago. You know, Salesforce isn't just an internal CRM solution. It's far more than that. Um, and there's a lot of external facing um, kind of use cases for Salesforce, like communities, uh, you know, sales communities support help desk. So um, people log in to a Salesforce um, over the internet and actually login probably isn't the right word because we have public facing pages that are accessible via the internet. Uh, and when you do that, you're using what's called a guest account in Salesforce. Now the guest account can have a lot of different rights. And of course people want to lock it down, but because sales, Salesforce is a big app with a lot of sophistication and a lot of complexity, it's easy to get a profile or a permission set configured incorrectly for that guest user. And so what happens is, is that guest user gets more access than people think to more objects and more records than people think. And then this can be used, especially if you connect to it via API to scrape a lot of information out of these Salesforce instances. So this is true. For Go yeah, ahead. go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, um, I was just going to say it's not the only SaaS app that has has uh, configuration issues like that. And, and for some of our uh, let's say offensive minded security folks on the line, um, you know, using something like a burp suite, you could send uh, specially crafted packets, you know, requests, particular web requests to these community sites to do a little bit of enumeration, find out the different objects that are out there that might have access to the guest profile. Um, with a little bit of creative Google searching, i.e. like the in URL Google searching, you might be able to find one of these pages where these objects are hosted and then request them via the API because this, this guest user profile has access to these objects. Uh, and you might be, you know, the sensitive or private or even, you know, potentially uh, restricted information might be finding its way into these communities and into these Salesforce objects that have the guest profile that have access to them. So that there's a much bigger thing to think about here, which is not just like, yes, this is one way that having some sort of public access gets exploited, but it, it also undermines, and I, I want to shout out like, like Amazon on this, right? A Amazon was dealing with this with, with public facing S3 buckets. I'm sure everyone on our show today has heard a story about someone who for some reason or another flipped a bucket to public. And it, this begs the question for me, is it up to the manufacturers to try to stop this? To give the example for Amazon, you, buckets used to have a potential to be set default public and had to be flipped to private. Then the default was private. Now, not only is the default private, but to set it to public, you actually have to click yes twice. Um, you have to click yes to the config. And then when you hit save, it's like, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, and then you have to hit save again. Obviously, if you create the bucket via like API or a Terraform script, it's not going to happen that way. But the if you're doing it, you, you know, via the Amazon console, there are a lot of barriers to you uh, setting and, and configuring a bucket this way. How much of the onus is on uh, you know us, the, the the users, the community that leverages Salesforce versus Salesforce themselves to uh, you know help help eliminate these loopholes? You know, this is one of the things about the shared responsibility model. Um, you know, I think people are responsible for, for configuring uh, the applications. And sometimes there's a little bit more responsibility than people realize. Uh, and there's some complexity there, too. I, I, I think that the S3 example that you gave is great, right? And making it easier for people to configure things in the right way. But still, it's not exactly for the faint of heart, right? right. There are several options, right? If you go into the S3 configuration, it's like you want only new stuff to be public, right? Or like old stuff, it's all stuff. It's like there are a couple different configuration options. And I think the sophistication and the amount of knowledge that people really need to have, um, let's just say it's it's it may be harder in the cloud, but I don't think it's really getting easier. You know, we've invested a lot of time in the on-prem infrastructure, configuring hosts, you know, configuring network security, learning about this. And there's just as much in the shared responsibility model, just because you may not have to patch an OS, you may not have to worry so much about the network segmentation on a SaaS. You still got to worry about making sure that things are configured correctly and really that the data is locked down. And there are a lot of knobs and, and options that you have to have to kind of know these days.
And I want I want to ask our audience this question as well. Uh, two part question, everybody. One, do you have Salesforce? Two, have you actually verified? Have you, you know not just trust that your admins are doing the right thing, but verify that you don't have exposure um, via this this guest profiling in your communities? The reason I bring that up is um, you know uh, we 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 see a number and you know customers who maybe don't uh, aren't, aren't monitoring uh, their Salesforce with a Veronis yet. Uh, they'll call on us because they have an incident. You know, someone tells them, hey, I got some data. I don't know how it got on the web. They think it might have originated from Salesforce. And what we're often finding is that security teams aren't quite as involved in the configuration of a Salesforce because it's usually someone else that bought Salesforce and had hired the people to administer Salesforce. And so it's a little bit of a black box to security teams, or maybe they only do manual review or they're just asking their admins. I'm really curious to see if any of our audience members have actually themselves uh, check to see if their Salesforce has had exposures or if you're relying on either a third party or your administrators to do that. Yeah, and th there's some big bucket items that uh, are kind of hard to see. Um, one of the, the other things that we see is the UAT environments, the sandbox environments that happen to have complete copies. You know, maybe it's like a month old, but then the, the access controls aren't minded in the same way there and the configurations in the same way. Yeah, and and we'll look for your feedback, but um, I think there was another a zero day, David, that you 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 were really eager to to share with everybody. This one has to deal with some uh, what, what was it called the the Cisco Prime collaboration deployment server, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. the the or a PCD if you're if you're cool. Um, but yeah, there's a zero day. This is a component that's part of their unified communications management suite. Um, and essentially, it's, uh, it's a component that runs on these PCD servers. Um, and these are typically internal servers, but there's a web UI to administrate them. And guess what? It doesn't validate input. Um, so look for a patch next month. But in the meantime, uh, you've got to kind of contain these servers, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, I would probably segment off that web interface to uh, just trusted hosts, a jump box or some sort of thing. I don't know what you'd recommend there. Matt. Yeah, and I was going to say, or if you've got the ability to monitor the requests that that web server is receiving, even if you're just streaming a log somewhere, because um, yeah. what you want to look for are someone that might be attempting to execute arbitrary code for the lack of this input validation or even do some reconnaissance. So just gather information back in the replies that might reveal uh, sensitive information. And you got to think, right, this Cisco device is on the internal network already. So this is a great place to uh, potentially even mask the, your, your reconnaissance or lateral movement or privilege escalation activities or even actions on objectives. Yeah, it's a it's a component that I think is probably likely to be, you know, not not messed with a lot or not thought of a lot by by admins, um, because it's probably one of these sort of, you know, it runs the, the comms and it's sort of set it and forget it. But this is a great place to hide. Speaking of which. Yeah, right, talking Matt, about hiding, yeah. right? Like like um 3CX is 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 getting another round. Uh, I I actually want to want us to call this a, a, a supply chain attackception for those of you that have ever seen the movie Inception and you know it's got many many layers, right? Uh, the the interesting nuance here is there was a this trading technologies was first targeted by the, this North Korean uh, attacker group. I want to say that uh Mandian is deeming them UN uh, let me make sure I'm, I'm reading the name of it. It's a, it's a UNC 4736. Uh, and they targeted a company called Trading Technologies where they were able to identify supply chain vulnerability. They used that supply chain vulnerability to attack 3CX to subsequently uh, establish another supply chain of vulnerability to attack their clients. So you've got this supply chain attack exception where one attacker group has a very clear motive uh, that they want to have these uh, very difficult to detect, uh, you know, most likely zero day vulnerabilities that then they leverage to go find more zero day vulnerabilities. And so I think the first thing you have to take into account here is you've got a very dedicated attacker that's not just going to spend the time to like get in your network and unleash ransomware they're after you know what might be your crown jewels your code or you know your manufacturing process to find a way to insert themselves in it to infect your clients and then if you've got clients that also make things their clients uh, and that's really the the nuance or the special thing that happened here now now in terms of 
who they targeted, right? We're, we're seeing both uh, financial services. Uh, we're also seeing the, you know, these uh, these information technology providers because these fintech companies they make a, a product, right? Trading technologies. They make a trading technology. 3CX. They make a, a phone and, and telephony collaboration system. Um, and we're also seeing some of the command and control framework that was used by the Lazarus Group, which might indicate a connection between UNC 4736 and the Lazarus Group, or maybe they're the same people. Um, you know, I think Mandian's probably out far ahead in terms of attribution here, and so we'll we'll look to them to see some updates. But what's the practice? practical advice here. I actually want to go back to something that Trevor talked about and some of our audience members did as well. We hear all these initiatives around zero trust, you know, around that, like, uh, you could, you, you, not, you know, assume that there's compromise everywhere. And how would you lock things down? I also think this undermines the importance of something, David, that you and I talk about a lot, which is like, protect the thing that you care about the most. Um, so that, that no matter what the vectors change, right? Like this is these are two vectors to your data, this 3CX supply chain attack, this training technology supply chain attack. If the thing that you're trying to protect is well hardened and well monitored, it doesn't really matter what vector the attacker used to get in. You'll know when they go after that thing. Uh, and I think if there's you know one takeaway, every show we have vulnerabilities to talk about. Every show we have zero days to discuss that give attackers another vector, uh, but the target remains the same. Yeah, and uh, and making sure that the right people have the right access as well as the right applications, right? At uh, getting getting to that least privilege model and then monitoring what people are doing there, it uh, goes back to that same guidance. And um, for those of you that don't know, I, I imagine it was a, a number of years ago, David, you, you actually had a really popular article in USA Today or something about another UDP protocol vulnerability. So um, I, you know, certainly pretty passionate about that. This SLP amplification attack, like what's that? What's the amplification? What's like the, the risk factor for, for our viewers? Yeah, this is this is really interesting, and and uh, I uh, I enjoy learning about these denial of service attacks. I'm, I've kind of seen them over the over the years, kind of evolve. But you know, this one is in a protocol called the Service Location Protocol. Um, it's a protocol that I think came out in 1997. It was designed for the use on the land, so you could advertise printers and other services. And it's uh, it's. UDP and TCP port 427, but the UDP part is kind of the operative part because that's easy to spoof. Um, and uh, that's because it, you can put any, any. it doesn't have the three-way handshake in TCP. So that, you know, the TCP is much harder to spoof. So that basically means you can masquerade as, as, a, as sending a packet from somewhere and you'll get a response back, even if that is to somebody else, right? And so that's kind of the crux of it. But this SLP module, in addition to being able to respond to the victim, right? So the attacker hits the SLP server and if they used a spoofed address, then that would go back to the victim. But the SLP service itself has a vulnerability where the attacker can register multiple services on the host and therefore take with one packet get a whole bunch of responses and that amplifies this so and those this responses have... can be bigger right so now you're Much, trying to get yes. to the point of this denial of service from just clogging up a bunch of pipes or connections between different hosts right exactly and then you multiply that by multiple hosts and now you could essentially have a wall of udp traffic of these slp responses that can overwhelm your pipe so this reminds me of the fraggle attacks uh that happened with UB udp before that the smurf attacks i love these characters but i i remember that one it resulted in t-shirts that i think i had that said no ip directed broadcast um that that initial smurf attack was a ping right to a broadcast address that then amplified everybody on that network would send the icmp ping res re uh, response to the victim uh and uh, anyway it goes way back so these protocols can be dangerous in right. terms of proliferation, I think the scans that we saw, there were a, somewhere around 60,000 hosts on the internet that were advertising SLP outbound. Do we get that number right? From Is that from BitSight? I think 54,000 is what okay. they said from BitSight. And then, you, you know, so 54,000 hosts and each of them doing a 2,200 times multiple of the initial packet. That's scary. It's a it's yeah. a big it's a big amount of traffic. We, Certainly you know, a decent yeah. amount of exposure, and primarily used in like uh, network devices like printers and um, uh, also ESX EM servers. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, that's right. So there's some stuff. VMware uh, talked about this and, and uh, warned about this as well. So, and that's not even the most dangerous thing we want to talk about. Let's jump into the danger zone uh, and, and talk a little bit about uh, some nation state activity. The, the first thing that I want to mention uh, around uh, this, this alloy Taurus, uh, also associated with, with something that's called ping pull. Uh, this is a Chinese nation state actor. They've got a, a new variant. They've got a Linux malware variant that they're using for targeted cyber attacks. But the, the most interesting nuance about this for me, I wanted to share with people is I don't think I asked a question like, around attribution, like how do we actually know who this attacker is? Um, and I'm, I'm always answering with like, well, start with sophistication and who uses these techniques in other places. The first layer of sophistication to ping pool is they've got TCP, ICMP, as well as HTTPS uh, backdoor and C2 communication channels. So they have this resilient infrastructure that no matter what you know, their initial, uh, you know, maybe it's ping pool, maybe it's sword, which is just another uh, malware variant they're using to get that initial foothold. They've got options. If you're blocking, let's say, HTTPS traffic or ICMP traffic from getting out of your environment or TCP traffic over the port that they're trying to use, or maybe you've even got some DNS layer. So Unit 42 from Palo Alto was the first to break the story about this. Obviously, all the, the Palo stack started to get some of those blocking mechanisms. Well, maybe you don't have the one that blocks the ICMP traffic or the HTTPS traffic or you know the threat intelligence that you have doesn't get all those signals. That's the level of resilience that a sophisticated threat actor brings to the table when they release a, a new variant of malware. Uh, specifically, who is you know the, they're targeting a lot of things in you know uh, government, uh, financial, I think financial services, mostly in the the uh, sort of uh, other side of the world from where we're sitting today, uh, countries like uh, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, Cambodia, um, uh, Russia. And I think in addition to you know, all, all the things that we would want to uh, mention to you guys about this, the, this, this rat, this remote access intrusion is this ping pull variant. Um, that is the new uh, thing to the table or the kind of the updated attacker techniques. Uh, and this group has also been associated with the name Gallium. So, you know, uh, many, many organizations are worried about espionage from uh, Chinese state actors going after intellectual property and defense information. Uh, and if you're in that part of the world, definitely probably want to make sure that your defenses are well aware of, uh, you know, Ally Taurus or, uh, or Gallium as it's hence been reforth and, and some of the things that you can do uh, to identify uh, whether it's ping pool or sword uh, getting dropped on your network. Yeah, definitely upping the sophistication there. Now, um, sure. upping the cuteness and the sophistication at the same yeah. time, you know, what is this charming kitten Bella Chow? Uh, what's the story here on that, David? Well, apparently this APT group did some market research and rat was not as popular as cat. So they've, uh, they're, they're, they're charming kitten. Um, just had to get the dad joke in there. Um, so anyway, this is an Iranian sponsored, uh, an APT group, uh, also known as something less cute, Phosphorus and APT35. Um, but uh, this is an ATP group, and they have malware uh, called Bella Ciao. And can you translate that for us, Matt? Yeah, that's beautiful hello in Italian. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and it, specifically, this would be of a, of a beautiful woman because it's we had Bella. Uh, but I mean, you know, I have uh, parlano poco d'italiano uh, for, for any Italian audience members that we have. That's uh, that's some good game right there with, uh, with that translation. Thank you. The uh, but anyway, this is uh, this is new malware. Uh, Bitdefender uh, per dark reading. It, it was discovered by Bitdefender. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. They custom build the malware for each victim. But what what I thought was pretty interesting was the command and control mechanism. The way that uh, it would do the command and control would be through DNS. And that's not new in itself, but the way they did it through DNS is every 24 hours, they would resolve a name. And the instructions were uh, kind of encoded, may not be the right word, but signaled through the resulting IP address in that DNS query. So each octet would have, you know, based on what whatever the number was, would signal different instructions for the for the malware to do, um, and so it's kind of hiding in plain sight. You know, I I, uh, I think we're seeing the the sophistication of this, um, you know, kind of just continue to elevate. Uh, it's not really clear so far what the malware is going to be used for in each of these cases, but it seems like Charming Kitten 
is trying to uh, charm its way into a lot of different organizations and, you know, to be determined later um, so what they're going to use it for. What a, what a fluffy way to art for, to articulate that. I, I think that, that when, when we talk about this, we've talked about DNS tunneling and DNS command and control before where attackers will use the host name to do the command and control part. So it'll be, you know, malicious domain dot command dot command dot com. But what you're saying, the, 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 the change here is that they're actually translating it to the, the actual IP address itself uh, in the reply that is then subsequently issuing commands. So kind of a flip-flop of the, the DNS command and control that we've seen in the past. And initial asset specters for Charming Kitten seem to be kind of all over the place. We saw things like the Microsoft Exchange zero days, the Manage Engine zero days. So really yep. any means that they need in order to get in. Yeah, this this seems to be like whatever the vulnerability is, however we can get in, get the dropper in, and then we'll go from there. Um, let's, uh, launch our, uh, for our, our, uh, our, our moderators, let, let's launch our feedback poll, uh, while David and I have a chance to, uh, look through the Q and A and look through the chat, uh, and see if there's anything interesting that we want to, we want to cover. Uh, I saw one person, uh, asking around, uh, a specific report for more detailed information, um, and how far that they want to go back. Um, uh, Corinne, we're actually going to have somebody follow up with you on that to make sure you get all the data that you're looking for. Um, as a, uh, but just for for general reference, um, we, we were always working with our clients and, and doing investigations. You you want to go back from the time when you think the thing happened, and you want to go back a little farther than that. So if you're if you're worried or you're trying to do an audit of access, maybe for DoD compliance purposes, you know maybe you want to go back a little farther than May. Uh, if you're trying, you're, you know this kind of time frame in question, just to give yourself a little bit of wiggle room that maybe that that zero day or that that you know timeline, that first point on your timeline might be earlier than you. Think. Think. Uh, and we'll definitely have somebody follow up with you around that. If you guys wouldn't mind taking a second uh, to answer our poll, we, we do really care about your feedback. This show is made possible by you, our viewers, um, and, and we take your feedback really, really seriously. Uh, and anything interesting coming in the, in the chat that we want to cover? Just uh, that Bella Chiao is apparently from Money Heist or so, uh, or it's a song or something. So we'll have to go check that out. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Robert. We'll, we'll go check that out. I always like the references there. Let's see, we get any, do we have the Q&A enabled or we just have the chat? We do. We, we only got that one question on a specific oh, okay. data advantage report. And I'd rather us give that person the most precise answer than the, the general one. Um, though the, you can use data advantage, uh, you know, our Verona software to run reports on all gotcha. kinds of access okay. and intelligence and misconfiguration and alerts. Uh, we'll make sure you get you get all the data that you need there. I, I did want to kind of echo one comment, though, from Diane, if that's okay with you, David. It's kind of talking about just this 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 kind of gap in security knowledge where not everyone is a, is a Salesforce architect and understands if they click one thing here, what the downstream impact is going to be over here. Uh, and just talking about the need for documentation and uh, sort of like steps and controls and who can set those configurations. So you've got the right people with the right level of knowledge setting the config and then the right people with the right training and knowledge, you know, confirming the config. I, I want to say something about that, though. When you start to think about that problem at scale in cloud, you start to get overwhelmed really quickly. Not everyone has the, the cyber force, the size of DOD or our largest banks, you know, with hundreds or even potentially thousands of people in cyber. Um, a lot of people are, are, are kind of just skating by with a couple of people. And so when you think about that, you, you sort of start to see the need for automation or start to see the need to, you know, partner with third parties to be able to do all of that uh, cloud or security posture monitoring that you might want to. Yeah, you know, it's a, it, I think this reminds me of a conversation that I've had with a few folks is um, just choosing what you want to invest time learning. You know, a lot of the configurations change quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of, gosh, you know, do I really want to invest the time in, in, you know, memorizing or really learning a whole suite of configurations that's going to be different next month? Um, you know, investing in things that, that don't change so frequently. Um, I remember back in the mid-90s, it was like, do I learn NetBuoys or IPX, SPX or I, IP? You know, and thankfully, I chose wisely on that one. But, uh, you know, it's uh, you want to uh, you want to kind of, you know, make sure you target your effort, you know, that's going to pay off. 
Yeah. And, and potentially use like a risk-based approach, right? Like spend your time on yeah. the things where the most risk exists. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the last question came in, you know, listening from, from Diane, thank you, by the way, Diane, listening to how DNS is being utilized in a similar way to how covert channels and hardware were utilized in multi-level security systems. Are those old methodologies relevant or becoming more relevant today? You, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I feel like the, the fundamentals, um, you know, you, you kind of can't escape them. You know, and the, these things that we talked about today with with some of the, you know, SLP, right, and, and the DNS, you know, without a fundamental understanding on how some of these bedrock things work, it's it's sort of hard to kind of follow along uh, with some of the newer the newer attacks, certainly. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the questions, but I, I feel like they're more relevant. I mean, we haven't fully transitioned to IPv6 yet, yeah. you know, and, and it's been we've been talking about that for over 20 years. I, I would say that if anything same methods more creative you know ways to implement and people are finding more ways to use this this you know age-old protocol that i don't think is going anywhere which is dns trevor i got one for you that came in from andrew um i read that the dod leaker was able to browse a database can you talk to how you can make least privilege and audit um people for sponsoring that database like it seems like a big miss that someone was able to have access to a database. Now, let's leave whether or not that happened or not for the mm -hmm. OIG report. But let's just speak to it generally, right? It, what could be done to make least privilege and make something like that auditable? Yeah, so a lot of it is just going to be around collecting the right data and collecting it from all the data sources. But on the other hand, when it comes to privileged accounts, they have to have extra scrutiny applied to them, right? We've seen a lot of tools that... Uh, password vault, administrative accounts, have a checkout system, right? So that if you do have accounts that have this elevated privilege and they are designed for an explicit purpose, right? And this goes for service accounts as well. When they're in use, we know when they're in use. And when they're not in use, they're not just kind of floating in the ether for somebody to grab or to use, right? Whether or not this person's activity was or their access was, was legitimate or illegitimate, the fact that they could kind of come and go as they please with no oversight or no like behavioral analytics to say this user's ticking up or in risk or ticking down in risk really prevents, presents a huge oversight. Um, and, and then this, we'll take this one last question here from Ryan. I'm going to point this one to you, David. We've got Salesforce, but security wasn't as involved in planning or rollout. We feel pretty blind to the Salesforce environment. What are our first steps? What should we do to learn more and investigate and what guardrails should we should provide? Now, before you answer, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. If, if you really don't know where to start, other than David's advice, because he's a Salesforce guru, um, you know, we do offer free risk assessments. It's not, you know, it's going to be a start, right? You're going to get an idea of what, you know, some of the misconfigurations that might exist or some of the exposure that you might have in Salesforce. And there is no obligation to move forward from that. So if you want us to take a look at your Salesforce, um, you can either follow up or you can have one of our, our uh, moderators follow up with you. But David, any, any other practical advice there? Yeah, there's uh, there are a couple of native tools in Salesforce, but the first place I'd check is what's called your org-wide sharing defaults. Um, what we're seeing there is a lot of the record types are overly accessible by default. Um, and, uh, you know, end users don't realize who's got access to which resources or which records in Salesforce. And, you know, they'll upload sensitive attachments or they'll put sensitive data in the notes, not realizing they're exposing it to everybody in the company. And the other thing is what I mentioned for, at, at, the, at the outset is check, okay, how many Salesforce environments do we actually have? And how many of them have external developer access because we need somebody somebody's help to do what we're doing? And how many have, have complete copies of Salesforce? Uh, and as Matt said, there's tons of configuration settings. There's tons to check with the permissions. And, you know, if you want to get a little help with that, it's, a, it's an easy process for us to do that. Yeah. Um, I think with that, uh, first of all, Trevor, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great to have an expert on uh, the public sector, especially on the Department of Defense, and especially, and again, how, how hot and relevant that topic is. Uh, welcome back, David, and thank you to our audience. Uh, again, like this show is made possible because of you. Uh, we really appreciate your viewership and your feedback and your engagement, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Trevor.